how to never, ever have a heart attack. Thank you so much, guys, for watching this. This is going to be huge, mostly for men, but also for women, of course. The number one cause of death in America is coronary artery disease. Tonight, I have on the show Dr. Brett Nolan. He's a board-certified cardiologist, and he's also a lipidologist. And I know, guys, you watch me very closely. You know I talk about lipidology and the details of lipids, and that's only one part of coronary artery disease, of course. So we have Dr. Nolan on the show tonight, and I want to ask him a bunch of questions. And guys, take your notes and bring this information to your physicians, please, all around the world. So Dr. Nolan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, hey, Tom, thank you so much for having me. This is a great pleasure, as always. Thank you. This is going to be really good. We've had you before. We could see the past video that we did together called yeah. Is Testosterone Guilty for Heart Disease? You can, guys, you can right. see that in the playlist. You can see that. So, okay. Number one, number one cause of death, Dr. Nolan, is heart yeah. disease. It's still yeah. heart disease. Is heart disease preventable? Heart disease is preventable. So heart disease kills more people than all cancers combined, plus all chronic respiratory deaths. And it's amazing because if you look at things, someone gets a diagnosis of breast cancer or colon cancer, it's a devastating diagnosis and there's, you know, there's so much attention paid to it and treatments are toxic, but people endure it because it's cancer. And it's amazing if you look at the incidence of mortality from that compared to things like having a vascular study of your legs and picking up slightly abnormal blood flow that has a higher death rate in five years than breast cancer with lymph node spread just as an example uh, not to downplay those cancer things uh, but this is the number one killer and people don't appreciate how virulent it is and although they, they're certainly genetic factors and you know, family factors that you're burdened with, uh, you know, it's estimated that 75% of events can be completely prevented if you do proper things at the proper time. So absolutely it's preventable. That's amazing. And it seems so, it's almost like people just accept it. Ah, I, I guess I'll have a heart attack one day. I mean, right. no one really says that, but as a primary care doctor for nearly 20 years, you know, before right. I became the anabolic doc or as I was becoming the, I would, I would look to these people and I would say, and, and this is both men and women. And yeah. men, we, we, we agree that men have heart disease before women prematurely. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. So again, this is evidence-based and, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons and there's a lot of support for this, but it seems like, again, that people just go, ah, I just can't. I, okay. So the next You're question right. is let's talk about the risks. We're going to talk right. about the risk factors and you and I as physicians, we're both internal medicine doctors. You're a cardiologist and a lipidologist. Yeah. So yeah. we both know Framingham and that's the classic calculator, if you will, and criteria that we use to assess a patient for the risk factors in the next 10 years. So, right. so this, and this is more, this is, this really is, is, you know, cause I'm, I saw that men are underserved and women are there too. You need men, women need, uh, support too, and they, I think they have better care than men. That's just my opinion. I think the yeah. data supports some of that. And I, yeah. men, I, it's a kind of I'm leading kind of the charge for men's health. So men are at early risk. Men. So if you're a man over 40, that's a risk factor. You check in the box. That's interesting. Right. So that's 40. Family history, and then we have the classic risks: hypertension, diabetes, and then I always say dyslipidemia, not just hyperlipidemia, because as you're the lipid expert, you've taught me that it's not just having bad high cholesterol, it's the abnormal cholesterol with having a low or a dysfunctional cholesterol panel with HDL triglycerides yeah. and the APO lipoprotein B and the LP little A. And you've taught me this stuff. In addition, Beautiful. doctors just don't know this because right. they, unless they're really researching it and then how, what you do. So right. th that, that's the, that, those are the risk factors. Please tell us about how to do this and, what are these risk factors before we go into lifestyle and diet and exercise? Yeah, so you're quite right. I mean, I, th I think a helpful way of sort of separating out 
these ideas is, you know, what are non-modifiable risk factors and what are modifiable risk factors? Because you can't really do anything about the genetic hand you've been dealt, right? You can't do anything about your age or your gender. So those are non-modifiable, unfortunately. And then you've got the, the modifiable risks, which you can absolutely do a lot about. Now, I think a really important unifying idea about uh, under these risk factors is most people approach risk evaluation from the risk factors first. And what, about, what I mean by that is you'll have people looking at cholesterol numbers and going, well, your triglycerides are high and your total cholesterol is above this number. Maybe we should treat you. Now, what's uh, flawed about that approach is that there's there's a very different range of responses to those risk factors. And that's probably based on what your blood vessel lining looks like, the endothelium, because some people have very vulnerable endothelium, so it doesn't take much to, to form plaque. And some people have very protective endothelium and they don't have plaque. So really the, the, the best first foray, and Tom, I know you do this because you're a smart guy, the, the right first test is to establish whether someone has plaque or not. First, that's the first thing out the gates. Because if you don't have plaque, why are you medicating those people? People get over medicated uh, so frequently in that space. Wow. Or on the other side, someone has rip roaring plaque, just hasn't manifest yet. And so they get ignored because they look sort of okay and look healthy and no one really appreciates it. And that's the guy that runs on the treadmill in the gym and drops down dead at 51 and everyone's horrified, right? And, and both of those types of people and everyone in between, you can actually figure out their risk by doing plaque testing. So things like calcium scans, things like carotid ultrasounds, ankle brachial insulin, all these sorts of things. Calcium scan is probably the best tool out there. And then once you've established plaque, then you should really take a deep dive into those risk factors, as you mentioned. Dyslipidemia is the single most important modifiable risk factor. Smoking is the second most important modifiable risk factor. Hypertension, diabetes, psychosocial stress, one of the top five, Wow! but very difficult to, to, to handle, right? Everyone has stress and it's, it's difficult to get a handle on, but that's one of the top five modifiable Quit your risk job, factors. Sir. Quit your job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. And then things, your know, dietary intake, physical activity, all of these things make it into the top nine most important modifiable risk factors. But again, all of these things should be um, evaluated in the context of plaque. Because if you don't have plaque, take it easy on that person in terms of over treatment and over medication, wow. right? Wow. And he, guys, so here we are, we're, we're, we're doctors and a lot of people scrutinize us or criticize us for you're you're just dumping medicines you know it's the the old statin they're dumping you're dumping so it's like guys i agree look at who you are and get the calcium score now dr nolan what age should we get the calcium score at yeah so that's a great question there's there's frankly terrifying data about studies that have been done uh, in 20 year olds 13 percent of which had calcium scores of one or more so uh, my personal threshold, I typically tell someone walking in through the door, get it at age 40, or if you had a first degree relative, a dad, a brother, whatever, you had an event, get it 10 years before the age that they had their wow. event. That's kind sort of, of like, my, my gestalt there. It's kind of like the colonoscopy. If you have family history of, co of, co of colon it. cancer, the, the, the gastroenterology guys recommend 10 years before that principal case. You got it. And Tom, you know, you bring up something fascinating. People do colonoscopies as they should. They go to the dermatologist to check for skin cancer. They get pap smears, they get mammograms. Hey, you should get all those things. But the one condition that dwarfs all this other stuff put together, you, that, that test, that equivalent is the calcium scan and, and a minuscule number of people. And get it's that. 90, it's, it's, it's low as $45, $75, yep. maybe hundred. It's not a CT yep. an guys. It's not, we order five a day. Sometimes it's not a CT yep. angio. If you're getting a CT angio drop back, that's the wrong test. It's a basic, it's a 22nd, uh, 32nd uh, general CT scan of the chest with no IV contrast dye. It's got mammogram. It's got energy 
of a mammogram, you know, for, for, yep. for the radiation. It's very cheap and it's effective. So, okay. You got it. You got it. So, so, so that's, so that's, so we talked about the heart disease is the number one killer of America. We talked about right. what the risks are, when you should get the calcium score, what the important thing is. Let's talk now. I've always asked you this in the meetings and I just, it's hard for me to get my head around. So right. Dr. Nolan, I, I, I'm going to, when you talk to patients as you and I both do and, and primary yeah. prevention, you see that too. Yeah. That, and right. my cholesterol is high, my LDL is not perfect, you know, and forget the other risks. Say, no, let, let me work on that. Let, let me work on that. Let me, let me change my diet. Now, the fact that they, let me change my diet. I, 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 this is my year. This is my year. This is my year to do it. You and I, you're laughing. Right. You, you're laughing because you, you. We hear it like, all the time. Oh my God. Yeah. This, we've been around this game for 20 years or so. We're both, we look kind of right. young, but we've been around long enough. So it's like, <laughs> right. you, you know, so it's, like, it's like, and then I'm going to work on it. And I'm going to start exercising. Then look, look, people in you know, women and, and included, you know, it, it's hard to do. It's hard for me to do. I like the medicines. It allows me to cheat. How much, how much medicine, how much behavior, you know, this is like what I do for you guys. And so is Dr. Okay. Nolan, you know, inner, so it's like, tell us. Tell us about this lifestyle from evidence-based perspective as your lipidology guy, from, from, from diet and exercise, how much can it really do when you have coronary artery disease before having a heart attack or stroke? Okay, so I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say the, the next few things very carefully because they're all true and, and I, I hope it clarifies some of the misunderstanding that's out there. Uh, so the very first thing, and I, I believe this wholeheartedly, a healthy diet and exercise should be the cornerstone of health. There's no substitute for a healthy diet. There's no substitute for exercise. You can't medicate away those things or another side, you can out eat all your medications, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's the cornerstone of health. This is where I feel the controversy has come in about things like cholesterol. The inappropriate focus of lowering cholesterol with your diet. That is the thing that I, as in my opinion, has sent dietary recommendations completely haywire. Because if you look at good quality data, which is randomized clinical control trials, and there are not many in the dietary world. Most of the trials, I, I get email links every single day. Ah, oh, your new diet says that eating meat's going to kill you. And then the next one says, no, no, but it's good. And then the next one says plant-based is everything. And you look at all of those trials, they, they are correlation studies, uh, cohort studies, as they're called. And if you speak to statisticians, that's the weakest kind of evidence. And that should be that should just stimulate thought and actual trials. That shouldn't be what we base policy on. Now, why that's so important uh, uh, is there was a presumption way back in the 50s that lowering cholesterol with diet would help because there was nothing else to offer people at that stage. And this started this ball rolling of, well, eat all, in all these different ways, eat seed oils, eat low fat, all these things. Uh, that were designed to lower cholesterol. And unfortunately, when the dietary trials came around, the randomized control trials came around to prove that that was already policy, they didn't. There was wow. no, there's no data to support that. So again, a healthy diet is extremely important, but the metric of that diet should not be your cholesterol. Okay. So I want to separate out those two, con those two concepts. Cholesterol is the job of medication to lower it if you have plaque. And all of the other markers that we measure in, in basic and advanced lipid panels, like triglycerides and HDL and inflammation and omega-3 levels and omega-6 levels and insulin levels and glucose levels, those are the things that your diet shows up in and you can modify successfully with your diet. So, you know, there's this camp of, well, ch cholesterol, the cholesterol uh, hypothesis is a myth. Most people, when they quote that, quote the dietary data to support that point of view. Guess what? They're right. Then you have the other camp that says, no, no, we have plenty of evidence that shows that you lower cholesterol with medications. There's repeated data uh, that it lowers events. Guess what? 
They're also right because intervening on cholesterol with medications is not the same thing as intervening with diet. So, so follow the one that has the evidence base, right? So don't medicate and don't worry about cholesterol if you don't have plaque. But if you do have plaque, that is your single most important modifiable risk factor with medications alone. Okay, so that's that's a really important concept. But, but I, this is I I get this, but this is this is even a mind twister for me. You know, and unfortunately, it's a mind twister for a lot of people because the waters have been incredibly muddied uh, by misinformation, uh, and you know I spend a lot of my day. Uh, trying to unspool bad data for people because there's a there's a very saturated message about what a healthy diet should look like and if i had to summarize what i think a healthy diet looks like 